Hi everyone, me again. I am so excited because this week we're doing an episode on Bakelite, specifically that form of plastic. But before we get into it, I want to say thank you to all of you for your continued um, patronage and uh, for your wonderful comments and also for your care and concern. Uh, just a quick note that um, I am pretty much fully recovered uh, and feel very blessed and very grateful. So this ep episode is about, specifically about Bakelite, and it's a form of plastic, and we'll start from the very base. Doing the research on this episode was a lot of fun for me because I've been connected to Bakelite since I was in my early 20s. And um, plastic comes from the Greek word plastikos, <laughs> if I said that properly, which means to mold or form. And um, it can be defined basically as uh, an inherently formless material. And there are two kinds. There are the natural and the synthetic plastics. So obviously, Bakelite would be in the synthetic plastics category. What motivated us to do this episode was I was blessed in having a gentleman contact me who had a large collection of Bakelite, something that he collected over, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 years. It was his wife's collection, and sadly, she passed away. And uh, he was somewhat knowledgeable about the pieces, even though it was really more his wife's passion. And many of the pieces covered a wide range. So categories that I acquired from him are whimsical, which would be, you know, character pieces, uh, World War II, and uh, things that were deep carved and um, just very special. In 1907, Bakelite was created by a guy named Leo Bakeland, and um, it was the first synthetic plastic uh, he created in a laboratory in 1907. Uh, it wasn't until the 1890s when a German scientist accidentally tried to clean his equipment by mixing phenol and formaldehyde, and Bakeland actually took this and played with the idea of re resins using heat. So the base is formaldehyde and um, phenol. So he named the substance after himself, and um, Bakelite had over 400 patents. And if you look at products that were made in that time period, everything from radios to flatware to car parts to, I actually have a razor from the 1930s that's Bakelite on the outside. Uh, the, it's incredible how much uh, Bakelite was used in the industry and it was because it was easy to make and it was inexpensive. And you have to think back to 1929 when we had the depression, people just didn't have a lot of money to spend on things and Bakelite jewelry could be found in the five and dime store. So you'll see a lot of pieces, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces that were made back then. And it's interesting because you can tell the difference between the dime store Bakelite jewelry and things that were made a little bit better by the findings, like pinbacks and, and things like that. I got to tell you that when I was in my early 20s, I was very drawn to the Art Deco period, and it was all because of one ring that I had that someone commented on, which was Egyptian Revival. And it made me do research in the library at the time, because there was no internet, on the Art Deco period. And I loved Bakelite, but even back in the 70s, in the mid-70s, good Bakelite jewelry was very expensive. So it was something that I never really spent money on. There are reasons why Bakelite costs a lot. Certain factors and characteristics are what in, increase the value of a piece. So like, for example, the necklace that I'm wearing is a uh, fake, obviously fake cigarette packs with cigarettes hanging. It's a very rare piece, and uh, we did research after I acquired the collection. And online, uh, you can see this necklace going for as much as $4,000, which really stunned me. Things that are rare uh, on this board, the spanking dad and child, very rare. Um, 
not as rare is this beautiful heart pendant, which was actually on the cover of Life magazine, believe it or not. And so whimsical or conversational kind of pieces can be quite valuable. Other factors that increase the value of Bakelite are how deeply carved, how thick the Bakelite is. These pieces are hand carved. They're not molded, which is something that happened later on down the road because obviously it's less expensive. But um, anyway, on this table, we have a good example of conversational, whimsical, right? Um, character pieces, deeply carved bangles, which I'm wearing as well. And then this board is all World War II. And World War II pieces also have, some pieces have extreme value. You know, think about baseball cards. I mean, some baseball cards sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it's basically just cardboard with a photograph and information on it. These things have personality and also have um, the love and passion and talent of someone who created them. I want to mention that Chanel actually used Bakelite in uh, 1925 to 1926 in her jewelry. Colors like ebony Bakelite were created to emulate um, jet jewelry, Victorian jet jewelry, and uh, butterscotch or amber colors were meant to um, kind of be imitation amber. And there's apple juice Bakelite. There's all kinds of beautiful colors which were created by mixing uh, magical concoctions. I'll just say that. In addition to the really whimsical pieces like the spanking dad and the cigarette necklace, other pieces to look for would be uh, the Philadelphia bracelet, which if you Google that online, you'll see it's a multicolored angled kind of, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's beautiful. It's like a wedge uh, with different colors and a hinge closure. Uh, I believe the value of that in 2015 was between three and four thousand um, dollars. And then uh, the other high value um, piece are the reverse carved um, bracelets, polka dot bracelets. Very hard to find, and the reverse carved really shows a level of artisanal experience to be able to do. Uh, many times in the reverse carved bracelets, the color is injected into the piece, or it can also be painted. Speaking of color, when Bakelite was invented, the colors were somewhat drab. And so with the evolution, uh, they, they started to do green, red, butterscotch. And they had to come up with a way to make the colors a little bit more exciting. You know, there's apple juice, which is clear yellow. It's beautiful. But in the 1960s, they came up with ways to actually add color. And it's an easy way to differentiate between the older pieces and the pieces from the 60s and newer. I want to thank you again for your time in watching these episodes. And I love the community that we've created with YouTube. Uh, we would like to ask you, if you haven't subscribed, if you would please do so, if you feel it's worthwhile. And um, if you like this episode, please give us a thumbs up. Likewise, if there are pieces that you see in this episode that are not yet online, please email the store because we can't attach images to our comment, our reply to you on YouTube. The email address at the store is thewaywewar at sbcglobal.net. I am really quick to reply to emails that come in, especially if they're potential sale. So uh, definitely keep in touch with us directly, and um, we look forward to hearing from you. So hopefully we'll have another episode up in a couple of weeks. And uh, once again, thank you. Enjoy the summer. Be safe and be well. Bye.
Leo Wegelen gab den Menschen The name Pino Formaldehyde his new invention And by patenting his baker light He beat his rival by just one night To rule the plastic age was his invention Baker light was very good Always did the job it should But it could be broken with a crash Celluloid brought to the screen The finest film they'd ever be Leo Bacon often mentioned The name Pino Formaldehyde, his new invention And by patenting his baker light He beat his rival by just one night To rule the plastic age was his invention Baker light was very good Always did the job it should But it could be broken with a crash 